Two of the most interesting features of human reproduction are menstruation and menopause. And menstruation is something that doesn't happen in all mammals, although it happens in a fair number, and menopause is really pretty rare. So they both require some special evolutionary explanation, and they both certainly have lots of medical implications. It has been hypothesized that menstruation evolved to eliminate parasites, to save energy, to protect the uterus from inflammation, or as a byproduct of maternal fetal conflict. And it's been hypothesized that menopause evolved to ensure the safety of the last offspring born, because otherwise, if the mother didn't stop ovulating, she might have another child and then die in childbirth before her previous offspring had grown up or so that the grandmother can help her daughter raise grandchildren, or as a byproduct of quality control of oocytes. So let's step through these and see how these ideas stack up. The major hypotheses for menstruation are, first, that sperm bring in pathogens, and this is a way of washing pathogens out of the female reproductive tract. So the claim is that menstruation occurs to protect the uterus from being attacked by pathogens. The problem with that is that menstruation occurs weeks after copulation, and the problem of pathogens coming in with the sperm is not unique to species that menstruate. There are lots of species that don't menstruate, and they also would have this problem. So that hypothesis doesn't seem too likely. A second idea is that menstruation is there to conserve energy, that it takes a lot of energy to keep the endometrium uh, up, and if you can get rid of it, you don't have to pay so many calories. So the idea is that you could resorb the endometrium and save energy. Well, maintaining a differentiated endometrium is not the alternative in other species, and it wouldn't allow for ovulation, for sperm transport, or sperm capacitation. A third idea is that it is a non-adaptive consequence of spontaneous decidualization, okay? Spontaneous decidualization uh, is something that we'll discuss in a few minutes, but it is essentially part of the uh, endometrial cycle. So this would be consistent with known consequences, and that is a position that you'll see can be supported. However, then the remaining problem is to figure out why spontaneous decidualization evolved. A fourth idea is uterine in preconditioning, and that is that menstruation preconditions the uterine tissues to protect them from hyperinflammation and from the oxidative stress that's associated with deep implantation, deep, deep placentation. That claim ignores why menstruation may have evolved in ancestral primate species and in menstruating non-primates, and it ignores benefits that spontaneous decidualization might provide, and there isn't really any experimental evidence supporting it. So to remind you about the human menstrual cycle, there is a follicular phase and a luteal phase in the ovary, which are mirrored in a proliferative phase and a secretory phase in the uterus. During the follicular phase, follicles in the ovary are maturing, estradiol rises, the superficial endometrium is shed, that's when menstruation initiates, and then the endometrium begins to grow again. Ovulation occurs 14 days after the beginning of menstruation, and then the luteal phase begins, the corpus luteum in the ovary starts to secrete pr progesterone, under the influence of progesterone, the uterus enters its secretory phase, the endometrium continues to proliferate and to differentiate. Then there is decidualization that initiates on the 23rd day. So what things menstruate? Here is a phylogenetic tree of some of the mammals. Menstruation is in pink. And it evidently evolved three times, in primates, in some bats, and in elephant shrews. Okay, that's kind of crazy. It's in three widely separated groups. There are some shared features in these groups, okay? In the higher primates, they have spontaneous decidualization, 
as do the bats and the elephant shrews. They all have invasive hemochorial placentation. The primates have extended mating. Bats have, one, one bat species has extended mating that's not restricted just to the pre-ovulatory period. And in elephant shrews, mating is extended over a long period because as many as, uh, many days are required to ovulate all of the hundred eggs that are released. They have a huge number of eggs that are released. Very few of them make it through. Ovulation is spontaneous, okay, so it's not being induced by environmental factors. Primates usually have one offspring. Bats usually have one offspring. And elephant shrews usually have two, and they only have three pregnancies per lifetime. So decidualization is the transformation of the endometrium that's stimulated by progesterone under maternal control, and it prepares the endometrium to receive the implanting embryo. If you take progesterone out, the differentiated endometrial cells undergo apoptosis. They die, and that's what leads to menstruation. So let's remind ourselves about the history of layers. The human invasive hemochorial placenta is ancient and primitive. It's not derived, okay? So what we saw in the previous slide is that menstruation was being associated with having an invasive placenta. However, there are many things that have invasive placentas that don't menstruate. So here are the things that menstruate and all of the things in white have invasive placentas. So there are quite a few of them. Some examples are hedgehogs and rabbits and mice and desert golden moles and rock hyraxes. They all have quite invasive placentas and they don't menstruate. So in mammals that don't menstruate, decidualization occurs when the embryo implants. In mammals that menstruate, decidualization is spontaneous. That means it is under maternal control and it occurs independently of whether there's an embryo in the reproductive tract or not. So why did it evolve? One hypothesis is that it's a maternal response that protects the mother from the invasive embryo. And a second would be to provide a mechanism that would allow the mother to discard defective embryos. So these are not mutually exclusive hypotheses, okay? But they are both, in a sense, a way of asserting maternal control over the state of the embryo. We know that there is quality control in the female reproductive tract, and it occurs through oocytic atresia and through abortions. Oocytic atresia, that is the killing off of oocytes, starts in the third month of pregnancy when the uh, ovaries are forming. There are about seven million oocytes in the ovaries at that point. By birth, six million have been killed. There are about a million left. And by menarche, there are only about a thousand left. And by menopause, there are just about zero left. So atresia appears to target both nuclear and mitochondrial mutations, and it seems to be a quality control device. Then if an oocyte gets fertilized, forms a conceptus, and implants, it then can encounter further steps where the mother may be inspecting it for quality and might throw it away. The estimates of the proportion of pregnancies that end in an early unrecognized abortion, a miscarriage, range from 30 to 75 percent. So those would be cases where the conceptus is going out in the first menses and the mother never notices that she was pregnant. Clinically recognized pregnancies, that is pregnancies that continue for about six weeks or more, miscarry in another 10 or 20 percent of cases. And most of those have chromosomal abnormalities. So those are pretty clearly quality control measures. Interestingly, with the invention of ultrasound, we discovered that about 70 percent of gestations that are diagnosed as twins end up as singletons. That means that there are many people who begin life as a twin who never knew it. Their twin was killed and resorbed. Spontaneous abortion may function both to eliminate defective embryos and to reduce the reproductive cost of twins. 
Now, that connects us to menopause in the following way, because one of the hypotheses for menopause is that it's a result of some of these quali quality control measures. Menopause is rare in mammals. It is derived in humans, because our closest relatives, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas, do not have menopause. There are two cetaceans that have menopause, and they also have close, enduring maternal uh, offspring interactions. Those are pilot whales and killer whales. Killer whale mothers have been observed to accompany their sons for decades. So there's quite a bit of opportunity for interaction with offspring. Let's take a look at how survival and fertility work in chimpanzees and in two groups of hunter-gatherers. Okay? So in these graphs, Fertility is the black line and survival is the dotted line. And you can see that in chimpanzees, they remain fertile right up until the age of 50. And that by the time they are no longer fertile, there are none of them left alive. So these two lines come together. However, in the Kung, that is, these are hunter-gatherers in Botswana and in Namibia, and the Ache, which are a group of uh, Paraguayan hunter-gatherers, both of these are natural fertility populations, you can see that reproduction is concentrated in the center of life, and that at the age when the chimpanzees both stop reproducing and dying, the Ache and the Kung stop reproducing, but they continue to survive. And if you just line up their fertility curves, Next to each other, you can see that the fertility curves are quite similar, but the survival curves are very different. Humans do have a long period of post-reproductive survival. That's called menopause. There are three hypotheses for menopause. The mother, the grandmother, and the byproduct hypothesis. The mother hypothesis is that menopause evolved as part of the terminal, the final, reproductive investment. Mothers terminated investment at that point to ensure that their children, their last child, wouldn't be endangered by the increasing risk with age that the mother would die while giving birth. In other words, they are saving their last child and making sure that it won't be put in danger by their own death. The grandmother hypothesis evolved to reduce the increasingly compromised reproduction of grandmothers so that they could gain more fitness by helping offspring raise their grandchildren. So in a way, it's related to the mother hypothesis, but it concentrates on the benefit that the grandmother can give to her daughter to raise grandchildren. The byproduct hypothesis, which connects us to oocytic atresia, is that it evolved as a byproduct of quality control. So a lot of attention was put early in life on developing mechanisms that would make sure that the first babies were high quality babies and it was just a byproduct then that you ran out of oocytes. These hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. The evidence is mixed. Here are a set of papers you can consult. Ron Lee at Berkeley has shown that intergenerational transfers from old to young can increase selection for longer life. And that would explain why, for example, grandparents are starting to pay for the college education of their grandchildren. That would be an intergenerational transfer. So to summarize, menstruation evolved at least three times in mammals and always in lineages that have invasive placentation. However, it didn't always evolve in all lineages that had invasive placentation. It appears to be a byproduct of adaptations to protect the mother in fetal maternal conflict. It may have evolved as a quality control mechanism. Menopause may also have evolved for a combination of reasons, including the mother and the grandmother hypotheses and as a byproduct of quality control. The papers that uh, you might want to read on this topic suggest that the mother and the grandmother hypothesis in combination do work in some populations to explain menopause. 